How do you do? From a broken home and a rebellious childhood, the man in our story built a successful career and family. He took great pride in what he'd accomplished. But when bad habits from his past crept into his life, he knew that his success was built on a weak foundation. At any moment, it could crumble into failure. But strength came when his heart and mind and life were unshackled. When's dinner? I'm starving. Dinner? You're lucky I'm even here. What are you talking about? I was so angry at you today that I packed my things and took the boys for a long drive. I, I didn't want to come back. Are you crazy? Where Where were you going? I don't know. I just wanted to get away from here. And you. So what stopped you? That should be obvious. I stopped when I realized I had no place to go. I have no friends. And with my folks dead, I'm all alone in the world. No, 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 no. You're not alone. You have me. That's even worse. Sometimes you can be more alone when you're married than when you're single. The man in our story overcame humble beginnings to build a successful career and home. To others, he appeared to live a comfortable life. But appearances can be deceiving. Underneath was utter turmoil. You'll find out all about it as you hear the classic true story of Richard Hall, right now on Unshackled. I don't remember much about life when my parents were still together. They separated when I was just a little boy. I don't even think I entered kindergarten yet. For a few years, my brother and I bounced back and forth between our mom's and dad's house. Later, we stayed with our grandmother, but that didn't last long. She decided to place us in an orphanage. It was the mid-30s, right in the middle of the Great Depression. The orphanage was located on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Sixteen boys and twelve girls stayed there, and we grew our own food and attended school together in a one-room schoolhouse with one teacher. On Sundays, we lined up in pairs to march three miles to church. We were given two pennies each, one for Sunday school and one for the church offering. Visitors came on Sunday afternoons, so it was a sad day for most of us. Where's your brother, Richard? He didn't want to come with me today. How come? He says it doesn't do any good. Maybe, but I still come here and wait. Some kids get visitors, relatives. Do you have any? Uh, I've got a mom and dad. You're lucky. Why? They never come to see me. At least you've got them. It's getting late. We still have a few more minutes. Someone might come. No, they won't. No one will ever come to see us. Where are you going? Back to the house to tell my brother he was right. See you later. I'm staying here by the gate. Why? So I can pretend. It's easier to pretend out here than it is in the house with all the other kids. Go ahead, but it won't do any good. You're just fooling yourself. By the orphanage's rules, I could only stay until I turned 16. When the time came, they sent me to live with my dad. He lived in a boarding house in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and had a reputation as the town pool shark. I spent a lot of time with him in the pool halls. Besides playing pool, guys hung around drinking beer and playing poker. <laughs> Somebody's lucky hey, today. Hey, hey, I need another beer. Yeah, we all do. Send Dick out to get some. <laughs> Good idea. Hey, Dick. Run down to the corner and pick me up a couple of six-packs. Sure, Dan. <laughs> hey, do you think they'll ask for his ID? No, everybody knows him. They call him the pool shark kid. <laughs> <laughs> Before long, I started drinking along with the rest of the guys at the pool hall. I would stay up late drinking and skip school the next day. My senior year, I was expelled for missing too many classes. College was out of the question. But my dad had other plans for my future. I see you've been borrowing my clothes again. So what? Well, you threw up all over my best suit. <laughs> Did you think I wouldn't notice? I, I tried to get it off. Uh, you drank too much and got sick, am I right? I don't think drinking had anything no, to do... Don't lie to me, son. Fine, yes. Well, if you like drinking so much, you belong to the Navy. You'll have plenty of opportunities to drink in the service. I'm only 17. Oh, that's old enough. They'll let you in with my permission. 
Both of my parents joined me at the recruiting office to give consent for me to enlist. Once I shipped off, I rarely talked to or heard from either of them. This was the start of a career that would last 26 years. I liked my life in the Navy. It gave me a sense of belonging that I'd never had before. I also learned a lot of discipline in boot camp. But after a period of intense training, I had a chance to relax. I relaxed the only way I knew how. I was very shy by nature, but alcohol loosened me up. <laughs> and the bartender says, I'm sorry, we don't serve breakfast here. <laughs> Man, Rich, you're a different guy after a few drinks. I've never seen someone come out of the shell the way you do. What shell? I'm a real people person. <laughs> Speaking of which, I thought you said we were going to meet some girls. Oh, no, 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 sure, be patient. Uh, Helen will be here any minute. She's a little chubby, but she has a cute face, and she might bring her friend, Francis. Uh, you know, she has a lazy eye, but she's fun. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. I like all kinds of women. Chubby, cross-eyed, bring them on. <laughs> the Navy built up my confidence. Before long, I got over my shyness completely. Soon, I became a third-class petty officer. One summer on leave, I went home to Harrisburg to visit Rich an old high school friend and drinking buddy. He introduced me to his cousin Kay. Her beautiful, slim figure and long, blonde hair caught my attention. But the feelings were one-sided. I was awkward around girls and didn't have much luck impressing her. I can't believe you're related to Rich. You're a lot better looking than he is. Um, <laughs> thank you, I think. Uh, want to go on a date sometime? I don't know. I hardly know you. Well, I want to get to know you better. Well, I'm sure I'll see you here again. Oh, by the way, my dad noticed that you've been taking his beer. Oh. As I got to know Kay better, she started warming up to me. I found that we had something important in common. I'd lost touch with my mother, and hers passed away from cancer. Her father was very protective of her, though, and he didn't like me coming around so often especially in the state I was in. Hey, get up! Huh? I'm talking to you! Get up! Uh, yes, sir. How dare you get drunk and pass out in my home? Uh, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, hey, sir. Hey, I didn't now you to... listen up. I don't want Kay spending time with a drunk deadbeat like you. And if I see you anywhere near my daughter again, it'll be the worst day of your life. Do you understand me? A short time after that incident, tragedy brought me closer to Kay. Her father passed away from a heart attack. With both of her parents gone, I became her greatest support. When the Navy transferred me to Virginia, I started dating Kay seriously and took long weekend trips from Virginia to Harrisburg to see her. On January 10th, 1953, we got married. Now, at last, I had a reason to turn my life around. I never graduated high school, but I earned my GED. For the next few years, I attended Navy medical schools. When Kay gave birth to our first son, his daddy was a first-class petty officer and an instructor and supervisor in the hematology department at the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Then, just after the birth of our second son, the Navy transferred me to San Diego for service in the Pacific Fleet. With a long drive on the highway ahead of us, Kay and I started worrying about our son's religious upbringing. We should have had David baptized when he was born. I didn't think of it at the time. I haven't been to church, well, in a while, so I lost touch with all that stuff. I think both the kids should be baptized right now. You're right. What if we get in an accident on the highway and one or both of the kids gets killed? Richard, don't say that. What? It could happen. Still. I mean, I was baptized when I was 13 years old, but better late than never. Well, let's do it as soon as possible. At the time, Kay and I practiced religious rituals like baptism, but we didn't consider our need for a savior. We were covering our bases. We thought that going through the motions made us right with God, but we didn't have a real relationship with him. We exchanged outward religious activities for inner faith, and without faith, my bad habits reignited. Soon I started going to bars again. Alcoholism wreaked havoc in my father's life, eventually killing him, and I was following in his footsteps. 
For the next three years in the Navy, I was assigned to work on cruises lasting as long as seven months. I was always the only medical person aboard. The other men called me the doc and came to me with all of their personal problems. I feel a little strange coming to you about this, but I need some advice. I don't know who else to talk to. Well, that's okay, sir. Whatever you tell me will stay between us. Well, this is a family problem. I got a Dear John letter from home, and it's shaken me up pretty bad. Hmm. I, I'm sorry to hear that. I know it's tough. I'm so furious right now, I, I don't know what to do. You're not the first man to come to me with this kind of problem. What did you tell the others? It doesn't help to get angry. See if you can focus on other things. Like what? I don't know. You could find a new hobby. Maybe take a correspondence course. You know, I've been thinking. Maybe I should pray about it. Well, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt. Would you happen to have a Bible I could borrow? Uh, no, sir. I haven't looked at a Bible since I was about 14. I went to Sunday school when I lived in an orphanage. I just thought there might be something in the Bible that could help me. I'll ask around. Maybe one of the other guys has one. Oh, okay. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'm afraid I wasn't very helpful. No, that's okay. At least you listened. How does the proverb go? Physician, heal thyself. During my time ashore, I thought my sons should start attending church occasionally. But personally, I didn't pay much attention to the Bible. I was focused on my Navy career. In 1962, I had a very important competitive exam. You mean, if your score is high enough, you'll become a commissioned officer? That's right. Then I'll go to officer candidate school for a couple of months. If I pass, I'll start getting more responsibilities. My career was right on track, but my drinking hadn't changed. I grew up watching men gamble when I would go with my father to the pool hall and so I was drawn to the slot machines at the Navy Officers Club. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. <laughs> hey, hey, Paul! That machine's about to clean you out. Yeah, it pretty much already has. Who's in charge of these things, anyway? Um, the club treasurer, I guess. Uh, then we need to elect a different treasurer. I can't win with these things. <laughs> I couldn't hide my habit forever. In time, I started coming home drunk. Kay never knew when I would come home or what condition I'd be in. But one thing was consistent. I lost more money than I brought home. My sin was destroying my family. When's dinner? I'm starving. Dinner? You're lucky I'm even here. Well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this crazy life we live. What's crazy about it? You married a Navy lieutenant, and I'm on my way to making lieutenant commander. What does that even mean? Uh, more money, for one thing. What money? The more you make, the more you drink and gamble away. I was so angry at you today that I packed up my things and the boys' things and took the boys for a long drive. I, I didn't even want to come back. Are you crazy? Where were you going? I don't know. I just wanted to get away from here. From you. So... What stopped you? Well, that should be obvious. I stopped when I realized I have no place to go. I have no friends. And with my folks dead, I'm all alone in the world. No, no, no. You're not alone. You have me. That's even worse. Sometimes you can be more alone when you're married than when you're single. Oddly, the booze and gambling didn't keep me from succeeding at work. As I kept winning advancement, attending special schools and hospital administration, my interest in religion grew. I thought a man in my position should go to church. I even read scripture during Sunday services. The decision was more about feeding my ego than following Christ. You looked so handsome up there this morning. You have no idea how distinguished you look in a robe. Yeah, and I don't even have to worry about ironing my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Could you hear me speak all the way in the back of the sanctuary? Oh, yes, you spoke beautifully. Your voice carries so well and your reading was so heartfelt. It made me proud to be your wife. My pastor was impressed, too. He encouraged me to leave the Navy, enroll in seminary, and become a pastor myself. It was tempting, 
but I didn't want to leave the service before retirement age. In July of 1966, I went to the U.S. Naval Hospital at Subic Bay in the Republic of the Philippines as food service officer. Kay and the boys joined me soon afterward. Because I'd been attending church regularly at home, I started going to chapel services on the base. A commander taught an adult Sunday school class. I noticed he taught directly from the Bible. Many people have uh, trouble understanding Jesus' parable of the hidden treasure. Well, let's read it together. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, uh, the which when a man hath found he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Now, you might have heard people say, uh, sell all that you have and buy eternal life. But that's not what Jesus meant, is it? In the parable, the buyer wasn't looking for a treasure. He stumbled upon it by accident, and he recognized that the treasure had more value than anything he owned. So he decided to give up his possessions to buy the field. And when he did, he became richer than he could have imagined. You see, the field is the gospel, and the treasure is Christ. The gospel without Christ would simply be a message about how to live a better life, being selfless, humble, loving. Yet what makes the gospel distinct, even from other religions, is Christ. He is the treasure that is worth our everything. He's more valuable than anything we may own, and truly, we could never have enough to buy Christ or be good enough to receive eternal life. He offers this gift of salvation, free of charge, through his death on the cross. And those that find the treasure of Christ will find a peace, joy, and richness greater than anything in the world. This man was not a pastor, but he taught with such confidence and with so much knowledge of the Bible. Later, we were invited to a servicemen's center where we heard missionaries from all over the islands. As we listened to them, we heard the gospel's message at last, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then an invitation came to attend a Bible conference in the beautiful town of Baguio in the Philippines. While staying there, we heard someone from the China Inland Mission speak. He had been expelled from mainland China for his beliefs. When we read about Jacob and Esau in the Bible, we learn that Esau sold his inheritance for a pot of lentil stew. In the story, Esau returned from hunting in the field and saw his younger brother Jacob cooking a pot of stew called pottage. Esau's hard work left him desperate for something to eat, so he asked Jacob for a bowl of pottage. When he did, Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright, meaning Esau's inheritance, which included his father's farmland, animals, and money. Thinking of nothing but his stomach, Esau replied, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? So Esau foolishly chose short-term satisfaction over the big picture and traded future wealth and comfort for a worthless bowl of stew. Many others have done the same. When offered eternal life in heaven as a pre gift of God's grace, they turn it away for much lesser things, the stew of worldly pleasures and money and power. If you're like that, you know you're a sinner. You should also know that Jesus Christ is calling you. If that sounds like you, please stand and we'll pray for you. I thought of all the things I'd accomplished in my life without giving any credit to God. Now a lot of you folks are saved and know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you die, you know you'll go to heaven. But you think of him more as an insurance policy than as your Lord? A lordship relationship means living for him seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Friend, do you see Jesus as your Lord? If you don't see him that way, I invite you to stand up too. 
I thought of all the poker games and the slot machines, the drunkenness and the family arguments, and I thought, I'm not living for God. I'm a hypocrite. I can't have a relationship with Christ because I haven't even accepted him as my Savior. I stood up. In the same instant, my wife stood too. The missionary prayed for us. Later, when we returned to our cabin, we knew it was time to call on the Lord. What's the next step, Dick? Let's kneel right here by the sofa and pray. <laughs> Lord, I love my family, my wife, and my boys. We believe what the missionary said tonight. Yes. We're ready to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Yes. And we pray for him to forgive our sins, mm -hmm. come into our hearts, and save us. Mm -hmm. Take me and my wife and my kids and all our time and talents and use them to serve your kingdom. Yes. I want to serve you the best I can. Please show me what to do. I need your help. Amen. Amen. In all the years since then, I never doubted that my new relationship with Christ was real. My marriage with Kay became more loving and peaceful, and our family grew closer through regular Bible study and fellowship with other Christians. My sons have also come to trust in the Lord, as Kay and I do. When we returned to the States, I took a stand for the Lord against worldly activities on the Navy base. At last, I was led to take my Navy retirement. The end of that career opened the door to a new one. After six years of study at Tennessee Temple College and the seminary, Kay and I returned to the Philippines as missionaries. Later, we transferred to Japan, where I served as the pastor of a church near a large U.S. Air Force base. I ministered to hundreds of servicemen and their families, and could speak firsthand about God's transformative power and deep love for us. Richard went to be with the Lord in 1988. He died knowing his life had a meaning much richer than money, power, or career achievement. And he helped thousands of others to find a deeper meaning in their own lives. God has a plan for each life, including yours. He can guide you through that plan if only you let him in. Won't you pray with us now? Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner, and I know that I need you in my life to help me leave worldly things behind and seek a greater purpose. Please come into my heart and forgive the sins that keep me in shackles. Guide my life and transform me to make me more like you. Thank you for your precious gift of salvation and your promise of eternal life in heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.